this is Kurt ASMR. I hope you're doing really well today. So, in today's video, I wanted to talk a bit more about my autism diagnosis. Um, I did a video uh, a few videos back about my diagnosis, just which was literally just about three months ago, uh, just over three months, under three months ago, back in June. I'm recording this in first uh, of September. So, um, and yeah, and what that meant for me, and uh, but yeah, I, I had lots of really supportive comments um, from other neurodiverse people and other people who identify as autistic, and um, yeah, it was really, really encouraging, and I'm, I'm really grateful for all your supportive comments. Um, and I did. Um, I mentioned it in one of my French videos as well and had a lot of comments from French people as well, um, French speaking people who wanted to know more. Uh, so I did a, a whole French version going into more detail uh, and I had to use Google Translate because my, <coughs> excuse me, my, my French vocabulary is not good enough to talk about that subject in great detail. So I think some people asked if I could speak more about my diagnosis, what makes me different, um, and go to more detail, because my last video was quite brief, um, excuse me, my, my hay fever is, is very bad today, um, anyway, uh, so I'll just kind of start at the beginning, obviously, like, growing up as a child, um, oh my god, the neighbour is coughing again, I, you can't pick that up, anyway, where were you, so when I was growing up, I, this sounds like, s like such a cliched um, thing to say, but I, I was always different. I, I just, but I was, I really was, and I just thought that I had no idea that I might be. You know, it wasn't even really in my vocabulary, sort of autism or, or, or neurodiversity, and um, I always just thought I was different and sensitive. Um, now the other thing is I come from a, a very turbulent family background. Uh, I had a parent who was an alcoholic and they were, uh, yeah, there's no other word for it, they were violent. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I also got bullied at school uh, really badly and more than most. And again, just because I thought, well, I'm just sensitive, I'm different, I'm artistic and it's just going to attract a lot of those types of people um, you know bullies um, you know people who are gonna be predatory to um, more sensitive weaker people um, and things would just get worse when I would get to secondary school which is what you do when you are at the, the school you go to when you're a teenager here in the UK kind of like high school but the ages are different in USA. Um, anyway, um, and again, I would put it down to just being uh, sensitive, artistic, different, and also to when I was in my later teens, the kind of volatile situation uh, in my family. Um, uh, when I was at school as well, I would really struggle with certain subjects. For example, mathematics, I, I was awful. I had to go into the remedial class, which actually did help me, um, but it was just something I really struggled to process. Um, I, was, I was pretty good at other subjects, um, but maths was a real uh, tricky one for me. Um, furthermore, I was always physically awkward as well. I was quite clumsy. Uh, I would uh, often bump into things, uh, and um, I actually went to the doctors when I was a teenager um, because I, f I felt really awkward and people said my walk was, was funny and I would actually get bullied for that as well. So I went to the doctors um, and they said, well, you are growing, and I did end up growing into a six foot three adult, um, so that's quite tall. So he's, the doctor said to me, that rapid growth is going to cause some awkwardness, you know, which is, is fair enough, it's understandable. But when I sort of reached my maximum height, and, you know, 17, 18, and I got out of school, 
and I, I kind of thought I, I went to college where you know you could wear what you wanted and you were treated more like adults um, this is not like American college not like university this is kind of like the two years in between school and university we call it college or you can do sixth form I did college and uh, so once I was kind of free of that school strictures I thought well why, why do I feel the same why now I've sort of escaped the bullies and the school uniform and those kind of strictures why why do I still feel awful and, and now I realized that what was going on at home uh, with my um, volatile parents and volatile home situation that that was you know that was still there that wasn't going away um, and so eventually I got out of that I'm skipping a lot because I'm trying to just relate this to my autism but yeah, I would just struggle with just doing everyday things that other people would do, like, um, like I, I, for a long time I was like in the arts, so I did like performing and, um, you know, uh, uh yeah, I, I used to love doing that and, uh, um, a lot of my friends are like, um, uh, they're like musicians or filmmakers and they're creative people, photographers and, uh, um, and they would sort of do their own projects. I've got friends who made their own films, like shorts and, and feature films. And you know, a lot of people would say to you, oh, "Don't wait for the phone to ring. Do your own, do your own stuff." So I'd I'd do my own stuff, but because it was so difficult for me to do this as an autistic person, often it would just end up in like a disaster. Or maybe you know. For me, it was like a lot of things would be disastrous, whereas for other people, they weren't. And, um, uh, yeah, and also relationships. So, um, yeah, I would struggle with like uh, romantic relationships, uh, friendships. Um, I think things kind of improved for me, maybe like in my mid to late 20s. Um, uh, and I still bear in mind that, you know, um, even then, uh, I I would still struggle with friendships. Okay, so sorry, I'm rambling. I had to grab my notes, but yeah, just I was saying, you know, just kind of free of all the stuff that I that I went through in my early life, and um, but I would still struggle, you know, and I couldn't really figure out why it's with friendships, with jobs, um, with things like that. Um, for example, in jobs, I would struggle to process information that was given to me, instructions and things like that. It was like um, water trying to trickle through thick rock, um, the kind of thick rock of my um, uh, neurology, basically. Um, yeah, it, I've just found it difficult. And um, like when I got to university, I, I really enjoyed university, but again, I would still struggle and I would um, get very single-minded, like for example, writing my dissertation because of what I'd been through as well. I was like, I felt like anything else outside of that was kind of like a deliberate threat to me um, because I literally had threats to me, you know, when I was at school and, you know, in an academic uh, environment. So, um, yeah, I feel like the world was out to stop me sort of achieving what I wanted um, because it kind of was at one point. Um, but I, again, I did, just didn't think, oh, I might be autistic. I thought my main theory that, that was that I had anxiety and I do have anxiety and, and that maybe the, one of, you know, some of the really traumatic incidents were kind of stuck inside me and I was stuck being sort of tense, like quite tense shoulders and awkward and I was kind of stuck in that awkwardness permanently and it, it was just a part of me and, and maybe it would go away one day permanently but it wouldn't because that wasn't the problem the problem was I have a neurodevelopmental uh, um, uh, diagnosis and you know, it, it's not going to go away. It's it's permanent, you know. So, but I I, I still had this theory. Oh, maybe one day I'll I'll sort of get past this, and yeah, I'll I'll not be, you know, essentially without knowing it, I was saying, oh, one day I'm not going to be autistic anymore, which is not going to happen. Um. So yeah, I would sort of um. Yeah. Uh, stumble through life not realizing that I was autistic and I didn't always stumble you know just uh, I've you know had some great things in my life had some great jobs and great friendships
relationships and I still do I have a great job at the moment but um, the thing that sort of the, the, the trigger point for me wanting to get diagnosed was I went on a family holiday last year to, to Malta and I touched on this briefly in my last video but I'll go into a bit more detail so um, there was a few mix-ups with like when we were in the restaurant and stuff it was like a hotel restaurant and it had a sort of cafe which was separate to the hotel but part of the hotel and then the main restaurant uh, in, the, in, in, in a breakfast area and these two places weren't very well delineated and uh, uh, my my parent and I, we sat in the wrong place for breakfast and the, the waiter was very short with us for doing that but there was no sign, there was no separation, there was nothing um, and, uh, and another time in the same place, a few days later we tried to order food, we just wanted like lunch, one meal for my parent and one meal for me and they, they brought me two meals and my, my, so they brought us three meals like they, and then, so there'd been some miscommunication that I'd ordered two meals when I only wanted one, it's like, I have a big appetite but I didn't want two main meals and it was just one of these misunderstanding things and it was so horrible because and what happened to me was I had what's called an autistic shutdown. That means when uh, an autistic person gets into a situation which is so stressful, which they cannot cope with, they cannot process, they literally shut down, their brain shuts down. Um, we can't speak, we can't, um, we can't think, we literally can't do anything. It's like being stuck in a, a glass case or a concrete case you cannot literally do anything and I've had this uh, lots of times in my life previously um, there was another time where I'd broken up with an ex and it ended very badly but I we bumped into each other sort of at a work gathering and I literally froze I mean, she she was very cordial with me and you know I think we sort of you know but I, I literally could not speak and until I, I don't know what I did. I pulled something out about the weather or something. But I literally could not think. And this happened to me after these incidents in, 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 in on holiday. Um, and essentially that holiday was ruined for me. It was... Family holidays are always um, a bit of a... You know, I, I think it... Um, I don't know how it is with you guys, but maybe you have to sort of adjust your expectations because it's not always about you. There's always going to be compromise, so you can't expect everything to be perfect. But for me, the amount of incidents sort of tipped things over the balance, and there were other things as well, like it was unseasonably hot. Um, uh, I was going through a bit of a rough patch with my fiance as well, and um, this was actually before she was my fiance. Yeah, proposed afterwards, so obviously things got a lot better um and we're great now but yeah um it was it was it was this shutdown and, and I, I was literally in this restaurant where they gave me two meals googling i can't think i can't speak and i found this amazing article about autistic shutdowns and and, and also there's meltdowns as well which i tend i don't tend to have but um you can have those as well and you can there's lots of youtube videos and, and you can google shutdowns and meltdowns but I'm very very prone to shutdowns so anyway you had this really quite bad trip you know and um, and it did make me sad because I kind of felt exhausted I felt more exhausted after this trip which is supposed to sort of help you relax than I did when I when I uh, when I set off you know when I was using my my PTO my annual leave for this trip as well so I was sort of made me really slightly annoyed, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, but anyway, that prompted me to go and to my doctor, to my general practitioner back in January of this year and ask for a referral for autism, um, so, yeah, um, and they told me that the waiting list would be three months. So what, what what you do is you go to the doctor. This is in the UK. I don't know how it is in other countries. You'll go to your doctor and they will do a little test. They'll ask you certain questions about, you know, how you deal with 
certain situations and, and how you feel about certain things and it's like a set of questions to assess for autism initially before they refer you and I actually scored I, I, I wish I'd prepared sort of all the things I'd been through and the notes I had because I, I didn't do that and and I think that I, I got like a score which was like borderline and he borderline didn't refer me on for autism but I eventually he eventually did thank goodness and he said it would be a waiting list of three months to to get an appointment so April comes along and I get my appointment for my autism assessment which is in June so two months later so uh, and I had to answer a few questions about myself so just to help out the, the person doing the assessment so um, at least I had plenty of time to do that and I did sort of leave it a a while before I, I felt able to fill out those questions and so the day of the assessment came along in, in June um, on the 10th of June this year and uh, and, and it was a, prof this pro a professional person who, who who assesses for autism um, and they asked me lots of questions about my childhood um, growing up um, how I uh, yeah what kind of things I went through how did I find certain subjects at school, um, my family situation, um, and sort of everyday everyday situations they would ask me about. Like, um, for example, one of the main ones, again, for autistic people is making eye contact. Now, I am normally quite good at making eye contact. However, sometimes I can actually get into a zone. It's usually when I'm going through anxiety. I can get into a zone where... Um, I can't make eye contact with anybody, so it, it will be because I'm sort of consumed with anxious thoughts and I'm sort of stewing over something. I kind of have like a bit of OCD as well. I ruminate a lot about past, you know, embarrassments and mistakes and, and you know, anxieties about, you know, whatever's going on in life at the moment. So if, I, if I'm in that zone where my thoughts are sort of taking over and I'll just go into a shop and I'm buying, you know, buying some bread or whatever or some toothpaste and I get into a zone where I cannot, cannot make contact with the server and I hate that because, you know, I've worked in the service industry and um, I don't think it, it would, it, it bothered me too much, it's just only when people are actually verbally abusive or rude but I, I really just want to be a friendly person and even actually as the transaction is happening, as I'm handing over my, my card to pay, I might make eye contact, make eye contact, make, make eye contact, and sometimes I, I just cannot do it. I can't do it. And, uh, um, it, yeah, I, so I get into a zone um, of, of not being able to, to, to make eye contact. So, um, so after this two-hour consultation and in, in these questions about myself, um, just checking my notes, uh, um, yeah, so she, she made that kind of proclamation, that diagnosis, diagnosis um, that it was autistic and they will then send you, send those notes to your doctor as well. Um, that moment, that day was very, obviously very um, kind of pivotal for me. It wasn't a big surprise because I suspected for a long time and I, I've been through a lot of emotions, a lot of grief. I'm still grieving sort of past broken relationships and lost jobs and, and, and ended friendships because they do, you know, if you're autistic, the, 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 there's a much higher chance of, of, of those things kind of going wrong. Um, you know, sometimes I've been looking at it like a kind of, you know, in a movie, like a zombie apocalypse movie or a war movie where somebody's driving through a town and it's all burnt out and there's burnt out tanks and, and burnt trees and things like that. And you people are like, what happened here? Sometimes I think, oh, God, that's my life. But it's, I'm being sort of overly dramatic. It's never that black and white. It's good and bad, but much more of a struggle, I'd say, because I am autistic. In, in my past and I'm grieving that but at the same time I am understanding the context of my autism in terms of many of those um, struggles that I've had in my life and my relationships and you know some of those are probably not down to autism they're just the kind of struggles that normal people go through breakups friendships ending uh, jobs ending things like that but a lot of stuff that happened to me I did I was 
would say was a much a disproportionate amount of things which happened to me um, and a disproportionate amount of struggle uh, compared to neurotypical people um, yeah I a lot of that I can put down to to my autism so um, yeah it's I'm still sort of working my way through that um, um, other ways it manifests, so I've talked about like the shutdowns, uh, the not being able to make eye contact, so sort of getting into like an anxious zone where you, you can't sort of make eye contact. Um, uh, my routines are very important to me. Um, I'm actually quite good at going with the flow sometimes, but for example, I, my weekly routines are important to me, so and I, I get sort of a bit off kilter if I can't do my routine so I love to do my ironing every week and I feel like I'm the only one in my friendship circle that does any ironing um you know but what I like to do is I'd like to do it all in one go instead of just eyeing the clothes I need for the day so I get all my clothes um you know uh pile them all up and it could be like two two and a half hours sometimes three hours um but the thing is, I, th I, I love that because it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to put on a movie, put on a YouTube channel, um, catch up on some ASMR or other YouTube stuff I like watching, or a Netflix show I've been trying to catch up on. And it, it, because I'm ironing, that activity stops me being on my phone uh, so much, I'll still check my phone. You know, I'm normal, but um, in that way. <laughs> It sort of forces me to stand there and concentrate on a show and then I've got a nice pile of flat ironing like I'm looking at my t-shirts that I just ironed over here and all like flat and looking nice on my on my wardrobe shelf and I love that feeling of just being able to grab something uh, and knowing that it's nice and flat you know um, even though I, I don't, I'm not really one that goes out a lot so and no one's ever criticised me for having wrinkly clothes maybe when I was in school and my uniform was but apart from that but I, you know, everything I wear is nice like that. And so, but that's just a personal preference. So my routines, um, working out is really important to me. I don't have a set routine because I do slightly different programs every week. And, and it depends on if I'm busy or not. Um, but just the, the act of at least doing a workout, you know, two, three times a week is really important to me. I usually do that straight after work. So my routines are important to me and they are very important to lots of neurodiverse um, people. Um, and yeah, uh, I think I do get anxiety about certain things as well. So for example, I used to hate Christmas just because of my upbringing. And sometimes it's hard for me if I have a big something big coming up, like a big trip or certainly Christmas is a big one. I just yeah, I just used to hate it, and, and, and it's like oh, I'm going away for a week. Oh, I've got Christmas is coming up. Sometimes I cannot see life beyond Christmas. It feels like this colossal thing that somehow I won't um, survive or get past. Or I don't, you know, even if I've got something, odd, you know, happening in in January or you know, it's my birthday in February. So I've, and I usually go away for the weekend in February. So. You know, I do have plans beyond Christmas, um, but sometimes Christmas feels so overwhelming that I can't get past it. I'm not sure, again, if that's a neuro neurodiverse thing or it's it's an anxiety thing, and lots of people feel that way. Um, but yeah, so um, that's my story. Yeah, um, yeah, relationships as well. Um, just in general, uh, I prefer one on one interactions like I have friends that I prefer to we'll just meet up for coffee go to the cinema big crowds um, gigs like I like music I, I'm, I think does anybody not like music but I I don't the big massive huge gigs uh, I'm not a fan of um, there was a whole thing about Oasis and I was I was a casual fan of Oasis in the 90s and there's a whole they're in the news recently I was kind of curious to just sort of go and see them but I you know that kind of big huge gig it just wouldn't be for me and they're not my favorite band so I'd rather go and see my f a band I really like um, my favorite band is the sounds who are Swedish and they haven't played for ages because the lead singer has a family and um, I'm, but I might have to travel to Sweden if I wanted to go see them so um, yeah let's rather spend the money on that so um, anyway um, oh the other thing I was going to
to say is, is just oh, being overwhelmed in busy situations, so sort of going on from gigs and things. The main culprit is airports. So if you work for an airport, I mean, some of them are getting better, but I had some, I've had some horrible incidents in airports where it's just been crowded and I didn't know where to queue for my check-in and, and where to go. And and uh, when I would go and see my, my fiancé in the USA and I was having connecting flights, I would literally need to find a, a sort of bench to sit on and, and just sit and have a snack and sort of get gather myself before I could like go back into the lounge to, to get my connecting flight, I would need to find somewhere sort of to be alone. Uh, now in the UK that's changing and a lot of airports are starting to recognize and provide uh, spaces for neuro, uh, neuro uh, diverse people. And um, there are charities where you can go and you can get a lanyard like this. I got this from, um, oh gosh, I can't even remember the name now. Um, yeah, uh, Spark something heroes, Spark something sparkles, um, yeah, uh, anyway, um, I can put a link in the description below, but they'll give you this lanyard with the sunflowers on, and also I got this cool bracelet with the, with the, um, of course I'm going to do ASMR on it, um, but yeah, these will indicate to a person that you are autistic, and in fact, Obviously, um, you can have a card which will say I am autistic, um, and so that's it. That is my card which says I am autistic. I've been diagnosed with autism. Um, there's a, a thing for emergency contacts on the back which I, I really need to fill out actually. So, um, but yeah, that will. And what that will do is hopefully, airport staff will be trained to see that you're an autistic person and that you might find it overwhelming and they will be able to help you find a space um, where you can go and um, uh, a, a, a quiet room, a quiet space. Um, they might help you with the check-in process. Um, I've not tried it yet since my diagnosis. Um, I'm trying to think if I've, if I've flown anywhere since my diagnosis. No, I don't think I have. I don't think I have, no. Um, yeah. I, I, I haven't, so I'm probably flying somewhere in uh, in December. Um, so we'll see if if this if can help me. Um, and you know, sometimes you, you won't. I, I'm actually okay. I don't always need that help, but um, sometimes I do, and especially in certain situations like airports, I do. So I am going to take advantage of this because I have had some horrible times in airports where it's just been overwhelming and I've ended up, you know, again, because you're usually going traveling for pleasure and you don't want your time ruined, you know, you don't want it spoiled, you know, before you've even taken off. So, um, and that's my story. I'm still processing, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, three months on from my diagnosis, just under three months and I'm still processing. Um, there's a great, there's some great resources like, um, that, that autistic guy, um, uh, Ar Orion Kelly, he's, he's amazing, he's an Australian neurodivergent, uh, person who has a book and a, a, an amazing, uh, YouTube channel, that's a resource, and, um, there's another one called The Thought Spot, um, I can't remember her name, but she's incredible as well, she's one of the first videos I, I watched when I was getting my, diagnosis so um so don't be afraid to look at look for these uh, resources because th there's some really good ones out there um and so yeah again i hope if, if this video has helped just one person um think about getting a diagnosis feel less alone if they if they're neurodiverse um maybe you're just curious as well um uh, you know I, I hope this has helped you and you found this interesting and um uh, and if not, you've had a, a whisper ramble anyway, so it's all good. It's all good. Okay, I'm going to go because I'm really tired. I didn't sleep very well last night. Um, I don't think I, yeah, I don't know why. I just couldn't turn my brain off, but I'm, I'm feeling tired now. So I'm going to have a shower and wind down uh, for the day. And I hope you will be kind to yourself today and every day. Uh, and I will see you soon for another ASMR video. Thank you so much for watching.
watching this. Please like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate your support and I will speak to you soon.